common manifestations of mitochondrial disease. Marnie? Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Hirano. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be here today with you and, and Colleen Urescu to speak about mitochondrial disease and myopathy. And I'll be speaking with you about the common manifestations of mitochondrial disease. To begin with, I'd like the audience to uh, answer the following polling question. When you see a patient with progressive myopathy, do you consider a mitochondrial disorder? A, all the time. B, when neurological or muscular motor symptoms are the only manifestations. Or C, what is a mitochondrial disorder? Please go ahead and answer the poll now. As we're here today to talk about mitochondrial disease, it's always helpful to start thinking about what are mitochondria. As many of you know, mitochondria are actually bacteria that um, invaded another cell more than two and a half billion years ago, allowing multicellular life to evolve. That was a pretty seminal event, and it can be um, now understood that mitochondria are very dynamic organelles that have a lot of key functions. Most people know that the major role of mitochondria is to make energy, and energy is phosphate bonds. Adenosine diphosphate combines with inorganic phosphate to make adenosine triphosphate. Similarly, in muscle, creatine combines with inorganic phosphate to make phosphocreatine. And when these phosphate bonds are broken, that is when energy is released to power activities in the cell. I see now that we have an answer to our poll. The majority of our audience answered B, that you consider a mitochondrial disorder in a patient with my progressive myopathy when neurological or muscular motor symptoms are the only manifestations. However, it's important to realize that mitochondria do more than just make energy. They also are involved in a host of cellular metabolic functions, including calcium homeostasis, the initiation of programmed cell death or apoptosis, free radical species generation and scavenging, the early steps in steroid biosynthesis, and I like to think of intermediary cellular metabolism as an orchestra where mitochondria are the conductor. Uh, there's an image that's not appearing, uh, but I think it's helpful that when people think about mitochondrial disease, what they're actually thinking about is the electron transport chain uh, that makes the energy. Oh, and as you can see on the bottom right of this slide, you can see that the cellular reducing equivalents for everything we eat that gets broken down to either NADH or FADH2 shuttles through complexes 1 or 2 to coenzyme Q within the inner membrane of the mitochondria to complex 3 to cytochrome C to complex 4, and that's where oxygen serves as the final electron acceptor. And in the process, a proton gradient is created across the inner mitochondrial membrane or a charge separation or a battery where the inside is negative and the outside is positive of the membrane. And that charge separation or battery powers energy production through complex five, which is the ATP synthase. And that allows the ADP to be combined with inorganic phosphate to make chemical energy or ATP. When this process fails, people consider that to be mitochondrial disease. Mitochondrial disease can have many features, including muscle disorders, but far beyond. Most people have some form of neurological involvement, muscle involvement, and or peripheral neuropathy. And I like to think of there being multiple nervous systems, the central nervous system, peripheral nervous system, autonomic nervous system, gastrointestinal nervous system, and any of these organs are very commonly dysfunctional in mitochondrial disease. However, nearly any other organ can become involved with respiratory failure, cardiac involvement, endocrine disorders, liver dysfunction, uh, a range of um, growth and um, metabolic dysfunctions, and even bone dysfunction. And what you can see on the right are some representative images to remind us of some pretty common red flags that make us think about a mitochondrial disorder in multiple organs. On the top left, you can see the brain where the arrows are pointing to hyperintensities, which commonly occur in a type of mitochondrial disease known as Lee syndrome, in which there's hyperintensities or signal abnormalities on T2 in the brainstem, midbrain, 
um, and basal ganglia that are often symmetric but can be fluctuating. In the middle top image, you can see retinal dysfunction, and this is often uh, a common feature of pigmentary retinopathy that's seen in many mitochondrial diseases, as well as optic atrophy. On the top right, a common muscle finding that might point you towards a mitochondrial disease are ragged red fibers, which are showing you that there's dysfunctional mitochondria and an adaptation in the muscle is to try to produce more. And those are what you see as the red ring around the muscle fiber. On the bottom left, you can see ring sideroblasts, which are a common finding in some mitochondrial disorders, such as Pearson syndrome, which is a deletion disorder in the mitochondrial DNA. On the bottom middle, you can see pseudo-obstruction, which is a GI finding that can be seen in many different mitochondrial diseases due to gastrointestinal dysmotility. And finally, on the bottom right, you can see thickening of the heart muscle, or cardiomyopathy, as well as very commonly arrhythmias. And these are pretty uh, common features, especially when more than one organ uh, dysfunction is present. When we think about the causes of the mitochondrial disease clinical syndromes, there's many. And it's easier to think about them, linking them together in groups. So the four major types of genetic disorders that cause mitochondrial disease are point mutations within the mitochondrial DNA, large-scale single deletions within the mitochondrial DNA, or what we typically call mitochondrial deletion syndromes, uh, multiple large-scale deletions, and nuclear DNA gene-based clinical syndromes. And I've given representative examples of common clinical syndromes that have acronyms that are well known to many in the group, MILAS, MRF, NARP, Lieber's hereditary optic neuropathy, or LAN, and Lee syndrome can all be caused by mutations that are point mutations, so one or two uh, base pair changes within the 16,569 base pair mitochondrial DNA genome. Copy number alterations, or thousands of base pairs that are deleted, are the what are seen in single large-scale deletions, and these include Pearson syndrome, which presents in infants, uh, Kern-Sayer syndrome, which presents more typically in um, middle uh, childhood or teenage years, and the chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia, which presents in adult years, with variable combinations of deletions in different organs that can lead to a variety of symptoms, including myopathy. Multiple large-scale deletions can also be the cause of PEO, or um, PEO plus, when more than just the eye movements are involved, or MINGI, as well as seen in aging. And when we see multiple large-scale deletions, we often think there's a causal nuclear gene that's causing disruption of the mitochondrial genome integrity or replication ability. Finally, a very common subset of diseases, um, including the mitochondrial um, depletion syndromes are nuclear DNA disorders. We're at over 300 different genes in which pathogenic variants may cause um, mitochondrial disorders. The most common is multisystemic disorders. Lee syndrome has many um, genes, uh, many dozens of genes in which mutations cause uh, Lee syndrome. The depletion disorders are highlighted since that's the main focus of today's conversation. In addition, there's other types of mitochondrial myopathy or isolated um, organ involvement, in, including cardiomyopathy, that may be seen. Focusing specifically on the signs and symptoms of mitochondrial DNA depletion syndromes, um, it's helpful to think of uh, specific organ involvement to understand what might be the most likely causal gene. So, for example, if there's sensory neural hearing loss and, uh, in an individual with mitochondrial DNA depletion, uh, the SUCLA gene, SUCLA A2 or SUCLA G1, uh, succinyl-CoA ligases involved in the uh, tricarboxylic acid cycle, or twinkle, the helicase involved in mitochondrial DNA, may be the cause. If there's liver-focused mitochondrial DNA depletion, you can see highlighted DGUOK, MPV17, and polygamma, among others, as common etiologies. For muscle-based mitochondrial DNA depletion, Common culprits are TK2 or thymidine kinase 2, which we'll he be hearing much more about in a few moments from Dr. Hirano, as well as RRM2B, as well as some of the other genes we've already discussed. Peripheral nerve, brain, kidney, intestine can also be organs in which there's symptoms and clinical uh, dysfunction in individuals who have insufficient amounts of mitochondrial DNA.
Sometimes it can seem confusing to understand what symptoms occur in which of the mitochondrial diseases, since all told, there's hundreds of different genetic disorders that are being grouped together with a common theme of not making energy properly through aerobic respiration in the electron transport chain. Yet, we've done surveys in the past, for example here published by Dr. Zokopli Cunningham et al., that went through and asked individuals how many symptoms each patient with definite mitochondrial disease had. Remarkably, when we asked patients up to 35 symptoms, we learned that the most common symptoms that were present in patients included muscle weakness as the top symptom in 95% of all types of mitochondrial diseases, chronic fatigue and exercise intolerance as well, followed very closely by gastrointestinal problems and balance problems. As you can see, there's a whole range of other symptoms as well, but these were the most prevalent across all patients in the primary data set as well as in a validation data set and also the symptoms that patients most wanted treated. What's further remarkable is that of all of these symptoms, we, the average number that either a child with mitochondrial disease or an adult with mitochondrial disease had was 16. That's a large burden of disease and typically involves more than just muscle, but really one should look for multi-organ dysfunction. Mitochondrial disease, as we've discussed, is genetically heterogeneous and phenotypically heterogeneous. It can cause any symptom in any organ at any age by any mode of inheritance. There is no single biomarker for mitochondrial disease. Many would like lactic acid or pyruvate to be that biomarker, and it is useful in some disorders, but in many disorders it is not, or it may only be elevated under certain conditions or at certain times. Many genetic causes exist, as we've described, across both genomes, our nuclear genome that has 20,000 genes and our mitochondrial DNA that has 37 genes. All mitochondrial DNA genes have had pathogenic variants that have caused mitochondrial disease identified, and already more than 350 uh, different genes um, have been identified in the nuclear genome. Collectively, mitochondrial disease is the most common inborn error of metabolism, affecting at least one in 4,300 people across all ages. In children, the etiology is more often nuclear DNA, perhaps two-thirds of the time, and in adults, the etiology is more commonly mitochondrial DNA, perhaps two-thirds of the time. But both types of disorders occur in all ages. So it's helpful to think of a mitochondrial disease as organ dysfunction, or rather, most often, multi-organ dysfunction. And now we know that it's commonly due to an energetic failure involving the oxidative phosphorylation or electron transport chain system. And more, more recently, it's become very clear as more and more of these genetic disorders are identified that there's different pathways involved and that understanding the molecular etiology is a big step towards precision medicine and finding the right therapies for what type of disorder is causing the mitochondrial energy production to fail. It's also important to remember that any mode of inheritance can cause mitochondrial disease. Because there's so many potential genetic causes, we have examples of mitochondrial DNA mutations that are maternally inherited, autosomal recessive mutations in nuclear genes in which one pathogenic variant comes from each parent, autosomal dominant disorders which may be passed down from one parent with variable penetrance or um, be new in the affected individual, X-linked disorders that can be new in individuals and more commonly affect males than females um, due uh, to males only having one X chromosome but can be inherited as well as sporadic, in which we find biochemical evidence of mitochondrial disease, uh, but we don't yet know the cause. And whether the siblings will be affected or the individual's offspring really depends on what type of mitochondrial disease they have. Um, and so it's very important to find the correct etiology. Working together under uh, the support of the United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation and international uh, colleagues in mitochondrial disease, there's a wonderful public resource known as the Mitochondrial Disease Sequence Data Resource. And here you can go and get information on specific genes or variants that cause mitochondrial disease. You can analyze your own genetic data from your, your patients, um, such as exomes from individuals or trios. And you can look up 
the pathogenicity of variants that you might find in a report. There's often a lot of information on phenotypes that any one gene might cause um, for mitochondrial disease. There's also a companion book called the Mitochondrial Disease Genes Compendium that's now available to be a bedside companion that lists all the information about each gene that might cause mitochondrial disease. So to um, end my section, I think it's helpful to just leave with this thought. Now that we understand that there's different causes of mitochondrial disease, there's more hope than ever because we can understand in the mitochondrial organelle where the problem might be. Is it in the electron transport chain structure or function? Is it in the mitochondrial DNA genome that um, makes the 13 core proteins of this system through a process of uh, translation that happens within the mitochondria that requires its own set of tRNAs and ribosomal RNAs? Is it problems bringing the nucleic acids in that have to form the mitochondrial DNA, such as in many of the mitochondrial DNA depletion syndromes, and for which there's new therapies emerging to try and fix uh, the deficiencies in the import process. There's many other processes, again, happening in the mitochondria, and so it's very important to have high suspicion for mitochondrial disease, to do the proper testing that we'll hear about in a moment from my esteemed colleague, Colleen Urescu, and to identify whether there are targeted therapies that might be available for the specific etiology. With that, I'd like to thank our uh, very uh, dedicated team in the clinical care, clinical research, and laboratory research of mitochondrial disease at the Mitochondrial Medicine Frontier Program at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and of course, our, all of our funding partners and the families uh, who participate with us in the search for therapeutic um, cures. I'd now like to introduce uh, Colleen Murescu, who will take us through the diagnostic workup and the place of genetic testing. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Falk and the organizers. So we're going to work through the workup and the place for genetic testing. We're going to start with a polling question. Can you diagnose mitochondrial myopathy on physical exam alone? Simple responses, yes or no. And Dr. Frano, anything that you note additionally on exam in a patient with mitochondrial myopathy? Yes. Thanks for that question. Um, so uh, mitochondrial myopathies present with proximal limb weakness, uh, typically, like uh, many other myopathies. But in addition, there can be other uh, manifestations that can be clues to the mitochondrial uh, etiology, the presence of ptosis, ophthalmoparesis, uh, and dysphagia uh, can be clues because these are frequently uh, seen in addition to the proximal limb weakness. Excellent. And this is just giving a, a snapshot of thinking about the diagnostic algorithm. When you see a patient and you have a high index of suspicion based on what Dr. Falk had showed, and the majority of the response I see to the polling question did, did suspect correctly that no, not on exam alone, because we do need to do additional testing. So we think about this in two different categories from non-invasive laboratory testing, such as biochemical testing and screening labs, and then as well as genetic screening, so whole exome sequencing and the mitochondrial genome. And then depending if your results are positive or inconclusive, what further analysis um, you need to perform. This shows a little bit about what to order and why. So in thinking about your blood, urine, and even if your patient's having a spinal tap for another reason, what other biochemical testing that you can do to help you further phenotype your patient? Because I think of this more as puzzle pieces. These aren't all, as Dr. Falk had said, there's hundreds of conditions underneath this umbrella, as well as Dr. Rana is going to tell, talk about other conditions on the differential. So thinking of carnitine to look for carnitine deficiencies, acylcarnitine to think about your fatty acid disorders, and CKs to really think about other causes of myopathy. And then as we're working up patients and thinking about them, to help assess for other concerns that you could help to treat your patients or aid you in your diagnostic approach, such as a PT assessment to really understand where that muscle weakness is coming from, an EMG to think really about the nerve to muscle signal abnormalities, and then a nerve conduction study could really help you in thinking about neuropathy, especially if myasthenia gravis is on that differential. You could do that with repetitive sim, And then other things to assess as you're waiting for this genetic testing also to make sure that your patient is safe, such as follow studies for aspiration, apnea, and looking at the brain MRI, as Dr. Falk had shown. Another polling question, 
all patients must have a muscle biopsy to diagnose mitochondrial myopathy. Yes or no? And Dr. Falk, what would you say the majority of your patients now that undergo a muscle biopsy? I think it's very different than it used to be in years past. So I think in years past, people came with the muscle biopsy first, and I think the entire community has moved now towards genetic testing first and muscle biopsy later. I think muscle biopsies are used either when there's a variant that's not clear is causal or more often in the adult population where muscle biopsy findings might be more significant. So it's very possible in very little children that when you look at the muscle histology, that it's normal even when it is a mitochondrial disorder. Excellent. And the majority did answer correctly that no, not all patients must have a muscle biopsy. And just in thinking about tissue-based analysis, location is critical based on what we can do clinically. That's where we have norms for in the vastus lateralis as opposed to other myopathies, you might be targeting more specific where they're experiencing the muscle weakness. And I think, you know, as Dr. Falk pointed out, a lot of different things can be shown on histology and pathology, looking at the ragged red fibers. I think there's a lot of great papers now that showcase that this is not pathognomonic to mitochondria, but it is a clue. Same with we looking at the Cox deficient fibers, which is the upper right-hand corner, which you see those ghost-like cells. And another thing, if your institution is looking at EM, it's not always traditionally ordered, but we have seen many cases where the morphology is normal, but we actually get some clues on abnormal EM, such as structurally abnormal mitochondria or those pyrocrystalline inclusions. And thinking about other assays that we can do on the muscle biopsy, thinking of how to assess what Dr. Falk was showing if they have an oxfos deficiency. So looking at that electron transport chain activity, also assessing for coenzyme Q deficiency. That in of itself, there are some primary coenzyme Q10 deficiency genes, but they are rare. But they can also assess for the secondary CoQ deficiencies, which can be seen in many mitochondrial disease. And more importantly, that can help with therapeutics such as administration of CoQ. And other things such as mtDNA copy number analysis, which Dr. Hirano will talk about, TK2, which is a mitochondrial DNA depletion disorder where you don't make enough mitochondrial DNA. Taking a little step back to think about how this from a biology standpoint at Genetics 101, you have one nucleus per cell, and I think of that as like one brain per body, where you get your traditional chromosomes, half from mom and half from dad. And then you also have your mitochondria, which has its own unique mitochondrial DNA that you just inherit from the mother. And you can have hundreds of copies of those in each cell. And thinking about how to assess from the genetic aspects, as Dr. Falk has showcased, that, that we're really transitioning to and what therapy is being more so driven by is looking at the mitochondrial DNA in multiple tissues. That is the trickiest part, I think, to some of this compared to other traditional genetic testing, whereas it can vary from tissue type, whether you're looking at urine, blood, muscle, skin. And assessing for nuclear gene testing, there are several options available. Panels might look at a more select group of genes, and I think it's really important, and we're going to go through examples of how to assess what exactly your patient has had done, but sometimes that can be costly and lead to additional testing and further delay a diagnosis. And exome sequencing can be more advantageous because it's inclusive of all genetic causes. You don't just have to select for the mitochondria-related disease, and you can include your other genes on differential. And other things to think about is whole genome sequencing, which has been around for a while now on a research basis and now clinically, and that cost is coming down, which may be more of a frontline test as those papers come out. And Dr. Hirano, what are you able to offer and do you offer all this testing at, at your institution? Sorry. Oh, Dr. Hanna, you're muted. Sorry. Sorry. Excuse me. Sorry about that. Uh, yes, so our, in our institution, we offer genetic testing, uh, mainly whole exome and whole mitochondrial DNA uh, sequencing. Um, and uh, on a research basis, occasionally uh, whole genome sequencing is done. Um, but we often also uh, send out uh, uh, samples for commercial sequencing uh, through uh, panels that are uh, appropriate for certain patients. Excellent. 
And I'm thinking about, too, also RNA sequencing, which has also been around for many years in the research realm, but now is clinically available, is tissue-specific. So if you have a gene of interest where you want to assess for RNA sequencing, you really want to make sure that that gene is being expressed in the tissue that you're testing. And this is just a summary slide to think about tissue-based analysis and what can be offered in thinking about more non-invasive things like blood or buccal, and then what to be able to use for, such as with the skin, muscle, or liver. Another polling question to see how well everyone was paying attention. All mitochondrial disease is inherited from the mother, yes or no? And to highlight some things, as we said, that are unique to the mitochondrial DNA, and the multiple copies in each cell, we use the terms heteroplasmy versus homoplasmy. And homoplasmy really talks about the wild type mtDNA that's present in, compared to the general population or the mutant homoplasmy, which is the difference in the mitochondrial DNA that's present. And more importantly is the heteroplasmy, which that shows the two different populations of mitochondrial DNA the wild type versus the mutant. And this is very unique to the mitochondrial DNA. You do not see this in the, in the nuclear gene, DNA. And the majority of have answered B correctly, that no, not all mitochondrial disease is inherited from the mother. And more importantly, we have something called the threshold effect. When the specific heteroplasmy load for an mtDNA mutation needs to be high enough and at different mtDNA-related disorders, this can vary quite. And obviously, too, we can't assess all tissue types to really understand when it would be predicted that your patient would have symptoms based on their heteroplasmic load. This just shows you a little highlight of a mom in the left picture that is affected, and she passes on her mitochondrial DNA change to her children. All of her sons do not pass it on to their children, but all of her daughters pass it on to those, their offspring. And then on the left-hand side, that photo really shows to see how you can have that mixture or that heteroplasmy shift. So from a maternal oocyte, there's a bottleneck effect that you can see there's random sampling and how many of those future embryos will have the mutation load. So whether it's a higher load, they're more at risk to have severe disease. If it's intermediate, they would have more milder symptoms. And then in low loads, they might have little to no symptoms. I'm just going back to the nuclear inheritance, while we think about the genetic test report, it really can be across all spectrums. And thinking about how to read a genetic test report from a patient, there's a few key things to think about. One, what was the tissue that it was done in? So was it done in blood or muscle, like in this sport? The report, it shows that it was done in blood. And then what was the actual test? So it says right here that it's a combined mitochondrial genome. So it tells us that they had the mitochondrial DNA looked at. And then mitochondrial myopathy nuclear gene panel. So that tells you that it's going to be a more selected test, but it doesn't tell me what exact gene. So if you go further into your report, you're going to see what methodology that they did. Um, so they spell check the genes by sequencing and deletion analysis and that they only looked at 51 nuclear genes at that time. And then thinking about whole exome sequencing, these reports can vary very differently from lab to lab, but once again, this was done in blood. It tells you that it was a whole exome sequence analysis. And then even if you go down to the areas that I have in black, it tells you that parental samples were, were submitted, which is very important when we're thinking about especially recessive disease as well as dominant to understand, is, are they located on opposite chromosomes, one inherited from each mom and dad, or is this de novo in the patient? And then also to think about when you're looking at tissue-based testing. So this is actually all on the same patient. So this is part of their diagnostic odyssey. We didn't find answers on the first round of testing. And then they eventually went on to have a muscle biopsy. And this is in skeletal muscle. And this tells you that they have a mitochondrial DNA point mutation at position 3243. A to G, and that's at approximately 66.6% heteroplasty. And it's really important, especially in this 
or of more sensitive diagnostic testing. If your patient had testing a long time ago, they might not have been able to depict um, the mutation load at a very low level. So you can look in the method session to see exactly where that heteroplasmy level is. So in this report, it shows that it's approximately 1.5% they would have detected a mutation to report out. So this was the answer to the patient. And to further evaluate what her heteroplasmy level was in other tissues, we also looked at her buccal sample. We did not detect it in blood previously because that was the combined test report. And when you, we look targeted for that exact mutation in her buccal sample, we can see that it was not observed. And once again, highlighting that we would have detected if it was anything above that 1.5% threshold. And then finally, we also were able to assess, it says source here, DNA. So you can have extracted DNA from any tissue type. Some people have brain biopsies for other reasons. Other people have liver biopsies. And you really want to know what tissue did that come from from the patient. And sometimes that's clear on the top, but in this report it's not, and you have to go further into the interpretation, which I've highlighted in yellow, which it shows that this came from her urine. And in this patient, we were able to detect this mutation at 7% heteroplasmy level. And this is a well-known phenomenon in this particular gene. We know that there's a heteroplasmic shift where you have it higher in affected tissue such as muscle and you lose it over time in blood and even in urine as you get older. And why this is all important for many reasons. One is also for family planning purposes. So it's really exciting to see that we have a lot of options prior to pregnancy. More importantly, for nuclear genes, you can test the embryo, and those that don't have the pathogenic changes would be implanted back into the mother to proceed with a pregnancy. The mitochondrial DNA is a little trickier because you're going to test the embryo, but we're only able to take one or two cells. So you're making an inference on those one or two cells and really trying to pick the embryo that has the lowest heteroplasmy to hopefully decrease the chance that that individual would have a higher level and be affected. There is also now mitochondrial replacement therapy where you can test either the oocyte or the zygote for the mtDNA mutation in the family and hopefully transmit the unaffected uh, embryos into the mother. This is currently not available right now in the U.S., but hopefully will be in the future, and a lot of research is being done. There's also, if your patient has already had a, has a pregnancy, and there's testing during the pregnancy, such as CVS and amniocentesis, where you're able to take cells either from the chorionic villa or the amniotic fluid. Once again, this is very reliable for nuclear gene changes. However, for the mtDNA, not all labs will offer this testing um, and, of course, proper counseling and close monitoring to make that interpretation is needed. And then, of course, after a pregnancy is here and there's other siblings, they all should be considered for testing or at least evaluated, especially for mtDNA-related diseases because it's not a yes or no answer like the nuclear genes. You really need to have that evaluation along with the testing to provide proper counseling. To the family. And just some key points, muscle biopsies should be considered in all cases, even with a negative genetic testing. Not all mitochondrial disease is inherited from the mother, and genetically confirming mitochondrial myopathy aids in a host of things, access to clinical trials, targeted treatment. It ends that diagnostic odyssey and then allows for proper reoccurrence risk and family counseling. And if your patient is undiagnosed, it's always important, just as we saw in our case, that really the increase in genetics and technology, checking back in every one to two years to make sure they have updated diagnostic evaluation. And here are just some resources to help you with the genetics and mitochondrial disease, such as what Dr. Falk had mentioned, MCPR, as well as an mtDNA resource, MitoMap, which links into MCPR, and the book as well. I'm passing it off to Dr. Hara. 